What's up, everyone? Welcome to the first non-Loki episode of Marvel Stand, and we're here this week to talk about Black Widow. And with me, as always, I have Den of Geek News and Features Editor Kirsten Howard and Den of Geek TV Editors Alec Bajalad and Katie Burt. I think the first thing that we have to talk about is the fact that this is a Black Widow movie. It's taken far too long for Natasha Romanoff to get her own standalone movie, and they did it after she's dead. So where does this movie take place in the Marvel timeline? Kirsten, why don't you uh, help explain this to everybody, just in case anybody's unsure. Marvel's Black Widow is set between the events of Captain America Civil War and Avengers Infinity War. Natasha is on the run from the US government and has to finally tie up some loose ends from her muddy past. Captain America takes place in the past, but it's kind of like bookended in a way. Like you don't, you're not really supposed to watch Captain America the first Avenger first even though chronologically it is first in the MCU stuff, you know? Even Captain Marvel, I feel like you don't necessarily watch that like in the place where it would take place, right? That it would be interesting sense. though. Now I'm wondering what that would be like to watch a chronological MCU. Because you're just kind of like, there's too many nods to all this other stuff. It makes more sense as like this interlude, you know, before, you know, before these, like between these other movies. Whereas with Black Widow, this is the first one of these that I feel like this would make perfect sense if you just went right from Civil War into Black Widow. It feels like it was supposed to be released then, even though this was always intended to be the real kickoff for, for, for Phase 4. How's everybody else feel about this? I think a lot of the press around it, at least um, a lot of Scarlett Johansson's, her talking about it, mentioned that they really didn't want to do an origin story, which I think was so smart. Um it, as you mentioned, Mike, this movie was long overdue. And I think to go back further in Natasha's storyline would have felt less rewarding. It's kind of interesting because they're doing something similar in Loki. And I think Loki is pulling it off where you're actually, you're meeting a like much earlier version of his character. But with the case of Natasha, I feel like we've seen her, we've seen her grow so much and so much of her character has been in the later um has been developed in the later mcu movies so i think this was the perfect place to to set her her standalone story this is the first mcu movie to me that feels like it came at the wrong time uh, timing doesn't necessarily matter in a lot of these other films you mentioned captain marvel captain marvel literally arrives as an interlude between infinity war and avengers endgame and somehow it works that way um we literally just saw half the universe get wiped away. And then we have time for a little backstory with Captain Marvel. And it weirdly kind of works in that context. Whereas Black Widow, um, while we'll talk about what we thought of the film a bit later, I enjoyed it, but it it really does feel like this was designed to arrive moments after Civil War. It's just odd they let a character die without this story before she died. <laughs> It's hard. I don't know if there was a good choice given where her character is and how long this movie took to be made. Mm. To be clear, I like that the chronology of the movie happens after Infinity War. I just wish in our real lives we had gone out to the movies to see it after Infinity War. Well, like future, future fans of the MCU can um, can watch it in this order. The only thing in there that kind of screws that up is the post credit scene, you know? But like that post credit scene isn't even really all that essential. We'll get to that in a little bit too. But the actual, yeah, like the actual like bulk of Black Widow, uh, I thought it was so effective as something that manages to tell an origin story without actually being an origin story. And it sets up like a key character for the future of the MCU. like. To do all three of those things so effectively is really rare. And it's like you kind of don't even realize it's doing it until, until you re reflect on it after. And that was something that I found kind of impressive about this movie. I think I really like a lot of the tropes of this genre. And I think I've therefore seen a fair amount of media, especially TV shows that... Um, you explore similar themes or use similar tropes. It was fun, but on a thematic level, it didn't really work for me. Um, I think a lot of it was we didn't really know a lot of these Black Widow soldiers that um, they're both fighting so hard to to save, and we're also told are, you know, which we know are that you know they've been not only brainwashed at this point and like taken as children, but also 
have this thing that is making them just follow orders. Um, but I never really understood who they were or why, I mean, why we should care about them past basic humanity. I think I loved it as much as you wanted to. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, Cause I, I did not have particularly high expectations just because of that odd chronological issue of this feels inessential when we're getting it. Uh, the Black Widow story is all wrapped up. Let's get over to Spider-Man. Let's, let's move past this nonsense. Uh, but I was surprised by how much I actually did like it. I feel like the script just makes good choices. Um, I really enjoy that the strange family dynamic at the center of it. Uh, it's a great sisters movie, a great siblings movie. Um, love David Harbour, love Rachel Weiss. And it's directed quite beautifully. I mean, save for when it goes kind of replacement level Marvel action scene at the end. Up until that point, I think it's a fairly well-directed film. I didn't have high expectations going in. It really did feel quite redundant. And I thought, well, I'm going to watch this. There's basically no peril for the characters. We know Natasha makes out to die in Endgame. <laughs> and we know Yelena is going to come up in Hawkeye. So who, are we, who do we care about here? Who do we care if they live or die? because these, this is a high stakes operation that these people are on. Um, but weirdly, I just found it massively entertaining. And I don't know whether that's, I think it's the team behind it have done just such a terrific job putting it together. You know, you've got Kate Shortland, who's, who's done a great job, probably some of the best action sequences, really high tier in the MCU, I would say. And Eric Pearson did the screenplay. He did that, uh, he wrote Thor Ragnarok, and he wrote Godzilla vs. Kong, both very fun movies. So it's not a surprise that this has turned out surprisingly good. Katie, I just want to address two of your points before <laughs> b before I talk too much Go about, on. about this movie. <laughs> yeah, like um, you mentioned something before about the, 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 the tropes of this genre were the words that you used. Were you referring to superhero movies, like to superhero stories, or were you referring to like spy blockbuster stuff? I was referring to spy, maybe not blockbuster, but like especially female-led spy stories. Um, this reminded me a lot of Hannah, the TV show. It's also a movie, but um, the TV show is definitely more recent in my mind, and I also think is better than the movie. Also, of the the highly underrated TV show Nikita. Um, but there are a lot of. Um, I feel like before we had a lot of, or more. Uh, female centric stories this was a genre where we actually you know for better and worse got some female led stories in cinema and tv so yeah i think maybe this this genre is a little bit more developed than this movie treats it well, i never know how to feel about the like soviet tropes as well it's like they do feel very dated and i don't really i don't know that always that also is another thing that i i wonder about like those don't feel very um modern <laughs> i i will say that the 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 parts of the movie that mostly did not work for me were just these like extended sequences of everybody talking to each other in these absurd soviet accents like <laughs> it's like look come on you lived you lived together for years doing american accents like wouldn't you maybe slip back into your old habits and like talk You're like it's like fine we'll stuff. ignore it we we don't we but won't ask you, any questions <laughs> why would you speak English in a Russian accent. I don't know. Just I don't know. But it just, it, like, it's like seriously, they were like, it it's, like Marie, it's Marie Antoinette rules. <laughs> this could yeah, have been dismissed with uh, just a, sim a simple line like, you know, let's speak in English like the old days. <laughs> like yeah. the old you start off speaking Russian, there's a few subtitles, and then somebody waves it away like, let's speak in English like the old days. And then exactly. they just slip back into it. They didn't need to do all that, really, did they? 30 solid minutes of people just talking to each other in accents that are so cartoonish. It's like everybody on here is probably too young to remember like Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons with Boris and Natasha. Think, darling, think. There must be something really rotten we can do today. I'm thinking, but the worst I come up with is helping to make Moose and Squirtle show one hour longer. You know what? I, we're not going to get into that because now it just sounds like I'm nitpicking a movie that I really, really liked and that... I'm not as um, I'm not as steeped in the genre as you are, Katie. You know, like for me, what I got out of this was 
Marvel has been talking for years about wanting to make movies that are more than superhero movies. And the example that everybody always holds up was Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Back then, the MCU was like a big deal, but it wasn't anything like the big deal it is now, you know? And at the time, they were like, oh, yeah, so our Captain America sequel, it's not really a superhero movie. It's a political thriller. And then you watch it and you're like, no, bro, it's a superhero movie. It's a great superhero movie, but it's not a political thriller. But Black Widow is not a superhero movie. Like, Black Widow is a straight-up action blockbuster you know, with with very few things that I feel are especially superhero tropes. And I think it's really effective that way. Uh, do, do you agree or disagree? I agree. <laughs> I think probably the main superhero aspect of it is David Harbour's character, um, Red Guardian. He's a super soldier. He has uh, super strength. And, you know, he can, even though he's getting on a bit, he can go toe to toe with the best of them. And the fact that he is such a larger than life character makes you feel like we're still in the MCU superhero vibe, despite the fact that we're quite removed from it. I think what this movie kind of reveals is that we've been doing superhero movies long before we had superheroes, because this is essentially a James Bond film. And if you think like, well, Natasha's not a superhero, how could she do all of these wild, out of this world um, physical feats? But we've done that forever it, before Marvel or DC or anybody came around. It was just, you know, James Bond or Ethan Hunt scaling buildings. Even the stakes of this movie, like the consequences of the villain winning this, while horrific and, you know, and dangerous to the world at large, are not the, like usually the, the stakes with a superhero movie are very immediate. Whereas if Drakov would have gotten away with this, you know, things would have just kind of gone on the way they are and gotten worse and worse as he continued to consolidate power. And that's something that I think is is kind of uh, not something we normally expect out of the genre. So I have to applaud, I really have to applaud this movie for kind of stepping out of the MC, MCU formula in some ways, uh, in a lot of really effective ways. And in terms of even the way the action itself is presented, uh, that big fight in Budapest, the one uh, Budapest, the big fight in Budapest that begins with Natasha and, and Elena in the apartment and then culminates in that wild car chase through the streets and into like that subway station. I mean, that might be one of the, that might, that's like one of the best action sequences in any MCU movie ever. And, and I didn't really expect something that hard hitting here. And I'm just thrilled that they pulled it off. It reminded me, like, the domestic setting and the way that that fight was staged reminded me a lot of Bucky and Steve's fight in Civil War. And it also reminded me of some of the action in Agent Carter, especially there's this really great fight scene in the first episode where she just uses, like, all of these things that are in her immediate, like, reach, like, her dom like in this domestic space. And I'm sure that wasn't, like, any sort of callback, but um, it just it made me think of, of how clever that show was with action. And I think, yeah, some of those smaller um, action moments, I'd like to see uh, Marvel lean into those a little bit more, I think, moving forward. To that end, I think Black Widow would have been an equally effective or even a more effective movie if they would have scaled back that, that third act by like 60% or more. <laughs> uh, I just thought it was a little bit too much and it doesn't affect the story and it's not really necessary for things to be falling out of the sky like that. You know, it's like, just like lean into what you've been setting up for the first two thirds of this movie and go with that. Um, I was not particularly blown away by that finale. I wonder what the first Marvel movie or TV show is going to be that's going to be bold enough to just allow for a more sedated ending. Because I feel like they're afraid to try it because there's so much riding on these movies. There's so much money involved, so many international markets that need to be pleased. And I feel like Feige and company are probably just afraid not to have a bombastic ending. I, I'm confident at some point we will get an understated Marvel ending. I just don't know which movie is going to be the one to take the leap. I mean, didn't Doctor Strange kind of go for it? That that Doctor Strange has one of the best endings in all right. of the MCU. Yes, because it's thoughtful and it's like, yeah, it's it's low key, but it it really works. Dormammu. I've come to bargain. 
And I think you can have a, a big battle if it's grounded in character in some way. Like the reason this feels done before is because it literally happens at the end of Winter Soldier. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is so similar to the to the climactic end of Winter Soldier. But in that case, we also have this um, very emotional like, confrontation between Bucky and Steve where Steve chooses not to fight. And there wasn't anything that worked on the same character driven level in this ending. I think Spider-Man Far From Home has a good uh, epic ending. I do think what you were just saying, Katie, about um, the Winter Soldier parallels is, is a good way for us to get into the Taskmaster reveal, which is so central to that final act. Taskmaster in the comics is a dude, for starters, and is not a dude with a particularly tragic backstory. And the Taskmaster that is presented here is unique for a couple of reasons. Like, obviously this is a completely new character. It's a completely new conception of the character. And it's somebody with like real ties to Natasha's past, but it's not the traditional scarred heavy with a revenge motive, even though there is a perfectly valid revenge motive here. So where's everybody at with Taskmaster? Because I kind of appreciate like how they how they really deviated from the comics here. I mean, we talked about how this fe really feels like a Bond movie and it does. And when the Taskmaster reveal c came up, I was like, well, of course, it's a Bond girl. It's Olga Kurylenko from <laughs> Quantum of Solace. You know, of course it is. Um, but I didn't see it coming and I thought it was a fantastic reveal. I mean, towards the reveal, I was starting to get the vibe that it was going to be her, but um, yeah, I didn't see, um, I didn't expect that to be the person under the mask, and I was, I was delighted. She was in a, um, a little indie sci-fi horror movie a couple of years ago called The Room, which was spectacular. She was really good in it, so I think that she can bring a lot to the role, so I'm looking forward to seeing her pop up again. I did see it coming, but I think at an appropriate time. I think uh, the, a good twist a certain percentage of the audience should be able to see it coming, but not too early. And I marked down, I think, 45 minutes in. I took some notes. I said, yep, 44 minutes and 30 seconds in. Like, the that is who Taskmaster is. I think we're all kind of taking for granted the fact that we'll see Taskmaster again. Um, because remember Ghost and Ant-Man and the Wasp? Hmm. She ends that film totally help, happy, healthy, and whole and we never see her again. I am very excited to see um, this character again, and especially with this actress. She's also in The Death of Stalin and in Vampire Academy, which is a good movie. In terms of the reveal within the context of this movie, it didn't work for me on an emotional level. Like at the part where Natasha, you know, comes up to her at the end, ugh, I like wanted to like it when, you know, she asks if Dreykov is dead. Um, but for me, it was just like, I would still, I would still be very upset with Natasha because I also think this was a choice that Natasha made not when she was like really, I mean, she was still within the clutches of the Red Room or the Black Widow program, but she had an out, she had choices, she had the support of Clint and what he represents and she still made this choice, which I, I guess the MCU is not necessarily prepared or excited to actually delve into what that would mean, but uh, I don't know. I just want. I just wanted it to be done a little bit better. It was weird that the thing that sealed the deal for the uh, for the U.S. was uh, Natasha ki killing a child. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, yeah, that was uh, that was what got the final thumbs up from the uh, U.S. government. Yeah, that that did seem really messed up <laughs> in a number. Of I was just ways. gonna say, like, not two series ago, John Walker got in so much trouble for killing one dude. <laughs> and, and there's been child murdering Natasha. Out this there's, time. There's, a, there's a difference there is that there were witnesses when John Walker killed a dude, whereas oh. there were, was there was nothing, problem. yeah, there was nothing <laughs> tying Natasha yeah. to the death of this anonymous child, you know? So that's a, that's a pretty significant difference. Like yeah. PR is PR, Alec. Like that's there's fair. real <laughs> politic and there's public relations. And, you know, these things affect S.H.I.E.L.D. as they affect all of us. I think maybe part of the disappointment uh, in the character of Taskmaster is that fundamentally she's an answer to a question that may have just been better a lot left unanswered. Because anytime you answer a question, 
the, a long standing question in a, in a franchise or a show or whatever you, mm-hmm. it's hard not to be disappointed because we've been hearing about Budapest for so long, you know. Just like Budapest all over again. You and I remember Budapest very differently. The, creates kind of a mythic quality of this event in her life. And then when you get an answer and the answer is only killing a child, mm-hmm. it's kind of weirdly disappointing. And that becomes the the emotional core of an entire movie. Can we just take like a moment to just talk about how, how, how freaking cool uh, Taskmaster looks and is because Marvel, when was the last time Marvel had like an effective heavy, just like, you know, a killing machine, silent Darth Vader type. And it's rare that we get that in these movies. And I thought that was like, you know, this kind of like Terminator-esque, you know, murder bot was kind of neat. Yeah, I like the idea of like a fighter who can mimic pretty much anyone's styles. I'm excited to see that used more. I think we have to go back to Winter Soldier again. Like this movie is basically just Winter Soldier. (laughs) Let's talk about David Harbour's Red Guardian uh, for a moment because he's a riot. And this is a character who, you know, isn't really much of a big deal in the comics. You know, there have been multiple incarnations of the Red Guardian in the comics, but this is the original one. Ridiculous accents aside, you know, it's kind of impossible to dislike him in anything. Well, I was expecting him to be great, but I, even I wasn't expecting to be that entertained by him. I thought his shtick was going to get old really fast, but no, I just enjoyed it all the way through. He was also really good in the opening sequence, like in a very different way. Um, And I love the moment where his powers are first revealed when they're escaping and he just like flips that truck. (laughs) It was just done so organically. Um, Yeah, I I love that opening sequence. Yeah, it's rare in a Marvel movie to see someone flip a truck and just go, oh, whoa, like (laughs) you just see it there a dime a dozen, right? But it was it was really effective. I think we should all strive to have as much fun in our jobs as David Harbour has in his. <laughs> so transparently. He's just having a blast all the time, and it's so apparent. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that opening scene, because I think that's why, that might be 90% of the reason why I love this movie. It's just a, a platonic ideal of, an op- of a cold open for a superhero movie, as far as I'm concerned. And not I, just because it's set in Ohio. I loved the opening. I loved the opening. Mm. And I love the Smells Like Teen Spirit cover. I want I want to put that on record. <clears throat> Katie's just saying that to bait me because <laughs> I uh, I I have I have a moratorium on all slow piano covers of like you know of previously fast and angry songs. I don't think uh, they should be used in anything ever again. Uh, so Katie and I, this is the one thing that we don't see eye to eye on. Unfortunately, it's really it's tragic. True. It's true. I love the opening sequence and and by extension, I, I love the Red Guardian because I love anything that kind of fills in the blanks of the MCU timeline. Whenever we get to see an era explored that is not part of the main line of the MCU, I think it's really interesting and it opens up kind of cool storytelling possibilities. And just like, if you just kind of outline that sequence and you say, yeah, for three years, the Russian version of Captain America was working undercover in America in the 90s. You go, wait, really? Like, that's cool. Like, and like in your head, you're like, there could be a whole movie about that, but there doesn't have to be, you know? And I love when they do things like that. They did that with Ant-Man with like the sequences, you know, set in the 60s with the original Ant-Man, like the little glimpses of that that you got. There's even a little bit more of that with the Red Guardian because he makes some outlandish claims that if there is even a hint of truth to them, it opens up the early 80s of the MCU to some exploration in the Cold War area in a way that we that we haven't seen before. Kirsty, I know you have thoughts on this. Let's have them. Yeah, he does say that he fought Captain America when he's bragging in prison and you know, they call him out on it. They say, "Well, when did this happen?" You know, like the the early 80s. Well, Steve was in the ice then, so you're just talking shit. But he, I think there's a possibility that he did fight Captain America. I think he's, there's a possibility that he fought Steve Rogers. And it really depends on how you view the events of Endgame as to whether uh, you buy into this or not. But possibly the Steve Rogers that went back to live his life with Peggy Carter 
might not have stayed as in the shadows as we expected before he popped up in at the end of Avengers Endgame as an old man. He could have fought Red Guardian. He could have been working with with Peggy at Shield, like on the down low. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that we might see some stuff like this in the past come up. Maybe even just like as fun Easter eggs, but not actually re revisit it or see Chris Evans again. There's another possibility though, and it's one that's kind of raised by what we saw in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which is that this could have been a replacement Captain America. You know, we know that Isaiah Bradley was briefly Captain America during the, the Korean War era. And that tells us that the government was not happy with there not being Captain Americas, that they wanted to try, like, I'm sure that every couple of administrations would try and say, why don't we revive the super soldier program? Like, why haven't, you know, they did this so well, why don't we do that again? And failed every time. And there's precedent for that in the comics where the idea of Captain America being frozen in ice and revived in modern times is, is was was like a retcon because Captain America comics kept being published after World War II. They just weren't very good, you know? And it went from being like dude who fights Nazis to dude fighting like commies during the Red Scare era. So when Marvel revived the character in the 60s, when Marvel was actually becoming the Marvel that we know and love, they were like, well, it would be cooler if Cap just disappeared at the end of World War II, and here's the story that will come up for it. But then as people got more obsessed with continuity, as somebody like me does, they were kind of like, okay, but then what about these Captain America comics that were published after World War II and into the 50s? Like, surely you must have an explanation for them. And like, you know, maybe the smarter thing to do would have been like, no, we're just going to pretend those didn't happen. But instead, what they did was they said, actually, those were replacement Captain Americas. They kept giving not just the Captain America code name, but the name Steve Rogers to these other like heroes because they didn't because the U.S. government didn't want the world to know that there wasn't a Captain America anymore. So it is possible that in 1983, 1984, when Red Guardian said that he fought Captain America, maybe he did. Maybe it was just a different dude wearing the suit something to think about no i like the james bond theory of how of you know there's a bunch of different james bonds and 007s mm. that are just different agents the dread pirate roberts yeah like yes like you said. yeah the only difference is is that the james bond theory is just a theory whereas in marvel comics and now in the mcu it is canon so i think i think there's something here but my favorite is still it's Stephen Peggy like working from the shadows like that's just always going to be my favorite. Steve is not the type to like just sit back. Like I know he kind of meant to like retire or whatever with that time travel, but that's not that's not his deal. Yeah. So of course we're kind of saving the best for last, and that's Florence Pugh as uh, as Yelena Belova, who is just absolutely amazing in this movie. And as Katie pointed out earlier, this movie is much more her origin story than it is even a movie about Natasha in a lot of ways. So let's talk about her a little bit because this is not just the breakout star of this movie, but I think this is somebody who is gonna be immensely important to the MCU going forward. I feel like I got in on the ground floor of the Florence Pugh experience because of Den of Geek. Uh, when I first started here, I was tasked with reviewing a horrible Netflix uh, horror movie in which she was randomly the star and she was so awesome and she just never stopped being awesome she has such a presence and she's just funny and cool and anyway i love her i'll just throw that out there are you going to tell us what movie it was or have you already remember, like, erased it? that from your brain <laughs> um does malevolent sound familiar it does as someone who recently like... recently read her filmography <laughs> like a lot of netflix movies i feel like i've seen it can't remember a single thing about it <laughs> 2018 <laughs> british horror film called malevolent yes. you know obviously marvel is setting up a lot of kind of legacy characters to to pick up the torch from you know from the core avengers who are either retired or elderly or no longer with us in other ways i think this character is going to be a fan favorite uh, i think she can absolutely support a black widow franchise on her own completely independent of natasha and i think she will be the centerpiece of whatever this team is that's being put together as we see in the post credits i also like that she does a pretty good job with the accent i think um, and I know in Marvel Cinematic Universe, those just come and go as Kevin Feige pleases or Wolfson <laughs> pleases. Um, but I, I can see Eastern European 
Florence Pugh continuing on in the MCU. I think she's bringing a lot to whatever she's starring in too. I mean, I think I read the the scene where she makes fun of Natasha for her superhero landing was actually uh, born out of Florence Pugh mocking Scarlett Johansson for that regularly on set until it became part of the movie and I'd like to see a bit more of that yeah I feel like that's one of the scenes that where they feel the most like sisters yes <laughs> um yeah I'll be, I, I if that's true Florence Pugh is this character do does do they have any interesting connections with other characters that are like I guess comic connections. Like, would we consider her of the generation of a of a like young Avenger in this world, or is she too old? Is she too old to be a young Avenger? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't consider her. So it's it's pretty clear that between you know we saw this in WandaVision, we saw this in Falcon and Winter Soldier, and we're seeing it to some degree in Loki with Kid Loki. Marvel is clearly keen on putting together some kind of young Avengers team. They're also, and this is where the post credit scene for this movie comes in they're putting together some kind of like dark Avengers team and they'll probably end up using the Thunderbolts name from the comic and taking elements from uh, from a comic that's called Dark Avengers, which is the same basic, you know, it's like, what if what if the heroes were actually bad guys? Whatever, Val, you know, Val is up to, it's clear she's putting together a team. Uh, this team we know will now include both John Walker and the new Black Widow. And I think we're going to get like some kind of team of anti-heroes, whether this is destined for the big screen or the small screen is another story, but I could very easily see her being the central character of this team. Mm. Wasn't Taskmaster invo- involved in the Thunderbolts as well, Mike? Yes. So I think, I think we'll see Taskmaster again as part of this as well. Um, this is where I think Alec, we mentioned earlier Ghost from uh, from Ant Man and the Wasp. <laughs> I was I literally think, waiting on bated breath this whole time. <laughs> yeah, like I think Ghost is a candidate for for this team of antiheroes that Val is putting together. But it's only a matter of time before we get this kind of team of, you know, slightly uh, slightly weirder, slightly darker, more antiheroy Avengers types. I think if anybody had any doubts that Natasha's actually dead and probably not coming back, I think that post credit scene kind of plays into that a little bit. Like, yes, we know Natasha's not really buried under that grave, but there's an element of finality to it. The world knows her name. You know, uh, we don't have that, like, that unknown factor that, uh, that Drakov taunted her with about her mother earlier in the movie. People know who she was. They know what she did. It feels like the red in her ledger has been erased. And I like the idea that, you know, that her her quote unquote little sister has been visiting her grave on the regular and, and continuing to pay tribute to her. I thought it was a really nice moment. And frankly, it's it's an element of the send-off that Natasha did not get in Endgame. It is such a nice moment. And I think it says a lot about Val's character that, you know, as Yelena comments on she uses it to this moment of vulnerability vulnerability to um seemingly like manipulate Yelena into doing what she wants which is going after Clint um which <laughs> feels like you know we're talking about the young avengers and the thing that gets me excited about that scene is is potentially seeing what the dynamic um between Kate Bishop and Yelena might look like. Um, yeah, I'm just, especially with like Haley Steinfeld and Florence Pugh in those roles, I think that's really, that's really exciting. I feel like it was kind of ruined with that picture of Hawkeye. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I, well, no, one wants, like, no, well... one, no one wants a Hawkeye surprise, you know, <laughs> and that's how they choose to end their first proper phase four movie is with a picture of Hawkeye. Ugh, this guy. Like a stock photo that someone <laughs> I was just really disappointed to see it. I did not enjoy it at all. I was like, is that really where we're gonna go? Like based on a misunderstanding by somebody, you know, putting mm-hmm. a spanner in the works between these people. Yeah, I didn't love it. 
It's like Jeremy Renner's headshot from like 1999. <laughs> just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that post credit scene alone was, I think, one of the reasons why I really wish they had done this movie after Infinity War. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, post credit scenes are post credit scenes for a reason. It's not necessarily meant to be taken in with the narrative of the full film. It's getting you hyped up for the next thing. Mm -hmm. But I just can't stop thinking, like, what if that happened pre-credits? It would be the most <laughs> jarring and bizarre moment in Marvel history of the stories wrapped up and LOL, six feet under, our character's dead. It was just so, um, I mean, it works. It, it does its job as a post credit scene. It gets me <laughs> excited for Hawkeye and Kate Bishop and all that and, and Yelena and Val. But just having the sight of your hero's grave, like, five minutes after they just achieved <laughs> self-actualization is so totally bizarre. You know, that kind of ties into just how much this scene is supposed to lay the groundwork for the future of the MCU. I mean, it's 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 meant to be a parallel to, you know, the, the first Iron Man post credit scene with Sam, with Sam Jackson showing up as Nick Fury talking about the Avengers initiative. But here, it's uh it could be the thunderbolts initiative we'll see we'll see what she's up to and who she's really working for is it called the thunderbolts initiative because of thunderbolt ross cool. <laughs> so liam hurt still getting paid <laughs> oh yeah that's a wrap on another episode of marvel stand we will be back next week to handle the season finale of loki and then we'll be back again to talk about everything else the mcu has to offer Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Thank you for watching Marvel Standom. We'll be back soon with all the hottest updates from the MCU. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Den of Geek US. Watch us live on Twitch at Den of Geek TV and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Den of Geek. Follow at Marvel Standom on Twitter and submit your burning MCU questions to MarvelStandom at denofgeek.com.